speaker for uh, our session today is uh, uh, Charu Jatta Naure. Uh, Charu did his uh, PhD recently from Mumbai Baba Center for Science Education, working in the broad field of biology education, which is of course his area of interest. But his second area of interest is also uh, the interface of science, uh, technology, and society. Uh, and uh, he's today going to talk about the first uh, interest of his. Uh, Charu did his PhD, uh, sorry, did his master's from Pune University in Biology. And he just told me that he also worked in NCM during the time ISA was you know, sort of coming up. So he has seen uh, not this, but the older campus of ISA from years ago. And uh, I also have had the fortune of working closely, but sort of only in bits and pieces okay. uh, on and off for a couple of years uh, in a very large uh, project in that Ashram Shah is in Maharashtra teaching or uh, the training teachers in, uh, who teach science in high schools. Uh, so Charu, uh, over to you, it's uh, about 50 minutes. Okay. And you can tell the audience whether you prefer questions to the beginning, the end or whatever. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So Thanks. Look forward to your Okay, so I will talk about how do textbooks, biology textbooks, talk about the living cell and uh, why does it matter? Okay, so uh, so uh, the, here is a brief outline of the talk. So I will situate this study in the area of science education because science education is a vast area and people are doing lots of different things. Uh, uh, so then I will talk about briefly uh, the methodology of analyzing textbooks. Uh, and then I'll talk about the results of this analysis. What do this analysis tell us about how do textbooks talk about the cell? And then I'll also talk about how this uh, conceptualization of the cell that is there in textbooks is deeply problematic. And then the question is, if everybody knows that this is problematic, why does it persist? So I'll try to understand, argue, uh, uh, why does it persist? And then I'll talk about some larger implications for this work. Uh, for science, practice of science, and for practice of science education. So, uh, I would love to have comments and questions, and it would also be interesting to talk about this with biologists. So, we will, uh, so I would love to hear your questions, but maybe at the end is best. Okay, so I will begin. So, in science education, there are lot of research that is done on conceptual affordances and limitations of uh, metaphors or repre uh, representations like metaphors or diagrams. So how do these metaphors help us understand the system? Uh, are there problematic conceptions that get transmitted? Does it help to talk about this uh, using this particular metaphor? Uh, but there is less research on the ideological underpinnings of those metaphors. <coughs> And sometimes it's very obvious that this uh, this discourse is politically charged, like genetic determinism or race. So when you are talking about that, it's very obvious uh, that it is politically charged. And then there are people who have studied these ideological implications. But there is also seemingly uh, non politically not charged, seemingly innocent uh, topics, which also carry hidden values. And it's also important to analyze those. And it's uh, difficult to do that as science educators, as science teachers, because uh, in social science classrooms, there can be discussions about, if you say a Spartan society was like this, there can be discussions about whether it should have been like this. Uh, is, uh, but in science classroom, it's not a question about whether cell should be like this. Cell, it is like, cell is like this. Uh, and it's also not very easy to challenge the uh, conceptualization of the cell uh, for students or teachers, because if scientists are saying that the cell is like this, it is like this. So, uh, so values can be hidden in a hidden way, get transmitted, which is more dangerous because if you are doing it directly, it's easy to counter or easy to at least be aware that that is happening. So very briefly, the methodology that I'm using to analyze textbooks is this methodology called critical discourse analysis, uh, which uh, uncovers these uh, social power relations, how they get manifested in discourse, such as speech or text or any kind of communication. 
So, there is this scholar called Fairclaw who argues that uh, this mass media discourse, newspapers, textbooks, uh, it uh, carries, it serves interest of the social power, socially powerful groups and the discourse is tailored such a way that uh, uh, interest of socially powerful groups it served and you can analyze it using choice of words, which words are used, which words are not used, what is obfuscated, where is agency highlighted through or obfuscated. So, I will not go into detail at this point, but when I will present the analysis, I will give examples, so it will be clearer. And another uh, theory that I will briefly mention that will be useful later is this conceptual metaphor theory, which holds that human uh, thinking is fundamentally uh, conceptual in nature. So, it is not something superficially, uh, it is not just a figure of speech, it is not very superficial, but it is very deeply about how we think. And there are metaphors that we often use and there are also underlying metaphors uh, for the metaphors that we use. For example, you know seed of an idea, idea is planted in somebody's mind then idea develops, grows, comes to fruition. So, all of these metaphors we use, but there is a hidden uh, un, uh, you know underlying metaphor that we do not explicitly say that ideas are plants, but that helps us structure how we think about this abstract thing called ideas in terms of something familiar like plants. So, this uh, underlying conceptual metaphor is not always clear but you can uh, try to uncover it using the particular metaphors, the particular word choices that are used uh, in discourse. So, this also there will be examples. So, uh, so uh, using this methodology I have analyzed some biology textbooks which are very popularly used and the rationale for doing that is I wanted to see which values are getting transmitted to students through these textbooks and these are very popularly used. So, a lot of students use it they are translated in multiple languages. I think ISER also uses Campbell, Campbell biology. So, uh, so these are considered standard textbooks and they are supposed to convey the standard knowledge of what society deems is the currently accepted knowledge. So, it is important to probe what they tell, right. So, uh, yeah, so I will talk about the discourse analysis of the cell. So, there are of course, multiple metaphors for this abstract idea of cell including the word itself cell which is uh, refers to this monastic rooms. Uh, and the, there are uh, there is a field called feminist science studies, uh, where scholars have tried to understand uh, what are the prior assumptions of hierarchy uh, that are present in these metaphors. For example, uh, the cell as a factory which is a very well known often used metaphor. So, there are uh, so Emily Martin for example, has talked about how the human body or at the level of cell is used uh, is described using these metaphors of production systems such as factory. And just like factory there is very exaggeration of uh, the amount of control exerted by the center. So, there is a head office uh, which controls this factory. Uh, so, uh, in this presentation I will build on these ideas by looking at the multiple different ways in which the textbook conceptualize the cell as a factory and how this hierarchy that is present in human social institutions, human social institutions uh, pervades the textbook discourse of the cell. Uh, so, so uh, here uh, this is a uh, cover illustration of science journals issue, uh, which shows this very succinctly and elegantly how cell is functioning as a factory. So, the purple nucleus is uh, giving instructions and there are various different departments which are tasked with particular functions. Uh, so, some textbooks of course, use this factory metaphor very explicitly, uh, but they also I will show that uh, it, uh, pre it is present as a conceptual metaphor, which is not often said and to uncover how that happens. I will see how these very uh, uh, features inherent to factory are reflected in the textbook description of the cell. So, for example, localization of decision making or knowledge at the top, information at the top. 
So there is this hierarchy between the mental labor that happens in the uh, head office and the factory floor, which uh, uh, which carries out manual labor. And there is a rigid division of labor. Different departments are tasked with different things, uh, and uh, So, to see the first point about how localization of decision making knowledge information uh, is localized in the textbook, in the four textbooks that I analyzed, I saw words related to mental labor, uh, uh, the counts of these words in the passages on the cell. So, uh, for example, word information, uh, the table tells us that. Uh, it was used to refer to the activities of nucleus for uh, 13 times. So, the ordered uh, bracket, uh, the ordered sequence in bracket is about each individual textbook, how many times it used. So, Campbell biology used information 3 times and Freeman used it 9 times. So, and the total count is 13. So, if you look at this table and you look at these examples, the nucleus functions as an administrative center or it directs the synthesis of ribosomes. And overall, overall uh, much more often these words invoking social mental labor are used to refer to the nucleus as against the rest of the cell, cytoplasm, cellular organelles. So, on the other hand, if you look at the words invoking socially, social manual labor, uh, that is much more often you uh, uh, those words which invoke the man manual labor are used much more often to talk about the rest of the cell. So, producing, synthesizing, uh, processing, manufacturing. Uh, so, a smooth ER, the third point, functions primarily as a lipid processing center, uh, is tasked with this function, uh, all kinds of lots of words, shipping, packaging, exporting, importing. Uh, so, they are much more often used to talk about the rest of the cell. So, overall 10 times more often they refer to uh, the cytoplasm or the organelles. Uh, but in these tables there was also some words where manual labor was uh, words invoking manual labor was used to talk about the nucleus. So, to do a more detailed analysis of how were, how were these words framed. Uh, I uh, looked at the grammatical structures of sentences uh, in the passages on the nucleus. So, how are, uh, so I will give an example about why such, what does grammatical analysis do for us. So, consider this example. So, family of Al Jazeera Gaza bureau chief killed in airstrike, and you will notice that it is unclear who launched it. So, it is uh, the passive voice and it is agentless. We do not clearly know uh, who launched it until we read the new uh, headline. So, the way it is summarized, it is not arbitrary. It serves, it is an exercise of power as Fairclaw tells us. So, the regarding nucleus, it is not as nefarious, but the pattern is similar. So, if you look at words invoking mental labor and manual labor and how often they were, uh, the agency was unclear. So, the passive voice was used without an agent. Uh, they are much more often used to talk uh, about the manual labor that happens in the nucleus. So, uh, in nucleolus, a type of RNA called uh, rRNA is synthesized from instructions in the DNA or it contains, uh, contains sites where this processing happens. So, you will notice that it is a site, nucleus is not in charge of doing this manual labor it is not a center for uh, carrying out these tasks. Uh, uh, and you can contrast this with uh, language used for uh, organelles. So, lysosomes carry out intracellular digestion. Uh, there are uh, organelles which are designated as center for doing something. So, here the agency of nucleus is obfuscated uh, often when uh, we refer to the manual labor that happens in the nucleus. And this is similar to how the head office is cleaned every day, but on the website of a company or institute, uh, the function of an head office will not be cleaning. But some contract workers are hired and they do the cleaning. So, that happens, but it has to be distanced from the head office. 
So, if you are thinking of nucleus as the head office, you would set uh, implicitly uh, think of it in this way. And one final way in which I will say how this hierarchy is manifested in uh, the textbook discourse is about how textbooks talk about the comparisons of uh, prokaryotes and eukaryotic cells. So, all textbooks mention that eukaryotic organisms evolved later. Uh, uh, so, and evolution is often mistakenly seen as a drive towards progress. So, it is hinted, uh, although, uh, so the, it is, uh, so this misconception is often in students mind. Uh, so, given this idea, it seems that what is evolved more recently is more advanced. So, what is uh, evolved earlier is primitive and then the fundamental feature of prokaryotic cells which are, uh, which can be uh, considered primitive is they have less compartmentalization, they do not have membrane bound organelles that is the perception uh, or uh, cellular organelles. So, nu uh, nucleus is not membrane bound. Uh, there is one textbook which does mention that there are some membrane bound structures in the uh, prokaryotic cells, uh, but this is also an interesting point that the complexity of prokaryotic cells is grounded based on the compartmentalization that happens. So, the assumption is complexity is related to uh, rigid compartmentalization. So, uh, given these differences and the discourse around these two types of cell, it seems that centralized compartmentalized eukaryotic cell is better. So, centralization is better. So, uh, I will uh, cite some a uh, lot of research which counters these ideas. So, one of the critique will come from developmental biology uh, that uh, tells us how the cytoplasm not just carries out instructions or uh, it does not just nurture the nucleus, but it has some information. The, there is also this uh, idea of organic codes in addition to the genetic code. So, we often talk about the genetic code, but there can be philosopher of biology, philosophers of biology have argued that there can be multiple different codes just like the genetic code. Uh, and there is also this critique of hierarchical division of labor that the textbooks hint at. So, uh, so uh, as I said cytoplasm of the egg. So, how does a single cell, how does a multicellular organism develop from a single cell uh, embryo. So, uh, so, developmental biology tells us that there are various molecular signals that are present in the cytoplasm. So, Jurassic Park the movie and it is a good science fiction, it is a plausible science fiction. The, what they tell us is they inserted the genes of dinosaurs that they had obtained from some method in a frog uh, oocyte and it developed into a dinosaur. And this is since this is supposed to be a science fiction, it seems plausible, uh, no, uh, it is not a fantasy and if the, if there is a uh, if the situation was reverse, we would not think that it is plausible that if you uh, add frog DNA in dinosaur egg cell somehow if you obtain it, uh, you would not think that it develops into an dinosaur because of this uh, valorization of genes as information. Uh, so, uh, but of course, that will not happen uh, frog, for oocyte you cannot really use. Uh, and uh, in this multiple complex developmental pathways, genes are often arbitrarily privileged as the ultimate cause, when in a cyclic networked system, uh, you cannot really pick what is ultimate, uh, unless you are assuming that this is the ultimate thing. So, there are computer scientists who have suggested that a better metaphor for DNA is data for the cellular a cell as a computing network and DNA is the data for it. And there might be, so uh, the way we think of genes as one of the metaphors that is used is genetic programs. Uh, 
So the program might be an emergent property of the cell without it having to be written anywhere. Just because we write program doesn't mean the cell has to have a written program. Uh, the program is acted out. Uh, another reason why genetic code is not the only code. Uh, so there is this philosopher uh, of science, uh, Marcelo Barbieri, who has uh, who draws our attention to this idea that uh, all biology textbooks speak of the genetic code, but uh, no one mentions other uh, cellular codes. And why is that? So he says that since the genetic code was predicted before it was characterized, it was characterized and glorified using the language of information. Uh, there is nothing wrong with that, it is a very useful prediction. Uh, like understanding genetic code is a very useful thing in biology, but then there could have been other codes which could have been predicted. And uh, so uh, all these molecular mechanisms that we know, they could have also been glorified using the words like information and codes. So uh, there can be several uh, set of codes that we can find in the cell. So splicing of mRNA, signal transduction, how uh, the outside messenger molecules and uh, uh, messenger molecules inside the cell, how do they uh, connect with each other. Uh, and uh, the last reason that I will tell why the textbook uh, representation is wrong is this idea of linear division of labor that the textbook suggests a very much like assembly line. Nucleus gives instructions for proteins, proteins are manufactured, then they are packaged delivered to locations. So organelles do not seem to connect with each other, uh, they do not have to uh, interact with each other. So, uh, but at the field of interorganelle interaction tells us that uh, organelles are also so first of all, each organelle performs multiple functions in addition to their designated, what we have designated uh, their functions. Uh, and organelles also interact with each other, physically connected with each other and also metaphorically in the sense of influencing each other's behavior. Uh, so this uh, organization of the cell, uh, where all the organelles are influencing each other's behavior. This is not a very exhaustive list, but just to give you an idea of the multiple different ways in which organelles interact with each other without going through the head office. Uh, so this suggests that the division of labor is different from the way textbooks tell us. So given we know all of this in biological research, not necessarily in the same language, but there is evidence to refute all these aspects of cellular functioning. The question is why does it persist? So I will argue that it, uh, you know, it seems the way this cell fu functions, given the society that we live in, it seems very obvious, very natural. So it resonates with us and I uh, will talk in detail about the different uh, factors in our society, how do they lead to this way centralized view of cell sounding natural. So the first one I will not spend uh, much time about, but it tells us that how we have a tendency to look for a central authority, central uh, figure. And I will uh, uh, focus more on the next two things. So if you look at how did we come to know what is the contribution of maternal and paternal parent in the biological mother and father in fertilization. So there were debates until the early 19th century about uh, which parent contributes more. There were scientists who believed that it the entire material contribution comes from the father. There is sperm which has human killers. There is people who believe that the entire material contribution comes from the biological mother in the form of egg and what sperm uh, provides it some sort of generative force, but nothing material. So when in late 19th century people could observe this fertilization in microscope, they could see that each parent contributes one cell each. Uh, but the problem was, uh, like it was not a problem, uh, it was also seen that the sperm is tiny compared to the egg, much much tinier. 
So, there was, so at this point, how should the scientific investigation proceed? So, there is, uh, if you think of the material contribution of the biological mother, it is obviously greater. Unless there is a component in both these parents, which is equal in size, which maybe that is the real uh, crux, that is what carries hereditary information. Uh, so, so scientists, uh, this view of the nucleus being the carrier of hereditary information started uh, emerging in the late 19th century. Uh, and there are historians of science uh, which have argued that this was a desperate attempt to find equality uh, where the evidence seemed to be against it. Uh, and we it is something that we can speculate about whether if the situation was different, if the extra material was contributed by the man, would it have been seen as uh, superfluous. So, uh, it is hard to know of course. Uh, so, again uh, I will clarify that there is nothing wrong with thinking of nucleus as the hereditary information and uh, finding the particular way in which it carries hereditary information, but you could also glorify the same uh, in the same way you can also look at the cytoplasm. right? Another way in which this view of the cell resonates with us uh, is the stratified structure of our society. So, so, if you look at the work of this American embryologist E. E. Just, uh, he was early 19th century, he was scientifically active in early 19th century. He was an embryologist, he focused on how the embryo develops early, uh, early on and he focused on the cell membrane and the peripheral cytoplasm. Uh, Just was also a black scientist in early 19th century, uh, early 20th century 1900s. Uh, and uh, so, and he focused on peripheral cytoplasm, and he talked about how it's capable of self-organization, self-development, self-differentiation. And he thought that the mainstream view that was emerging in embryology about how it's just a nurturing thing for the uh, uh, development that is controlled from the top. He thought that that view is mistaken, that was gaining prominence. And uh, there is a developmental biologist called uh, Scott Gilbert, who has analyzed just science in light of its social position. So, the way just talk about cytoplasm has the potential for development, what nucleus adds or removes is obstacles from its path, is diametrically opposite from the uh, view that the cytoplasm does not know how to do anything. People sitting at top uh, give it instructions and then it can develop. You can characterize a development using both these channels. So, development in particular way can be thought of as obstacles in developing in other ways. So, uh, scientifically both could have been possible ways, uh, but this uh, assumption of the, uh, uh, the mainstream view of the cell that is highlighted uh, using just a view of cell is important that just thought that people know how to develop as long as the government removes restrictions as against people uh, scientists mostly who have coming from uh, privileged social classes might resonate more with uh, the component that gives instructions and then things get done. So, uh, so this also tells us the uh, hidden value that is communicated through the cell as a factory metaphor. So, Nobel laureate David Baltimore talked about DNA as the executive suite and cytoplasm as the factory floor. And it, uh, this metaphor undervalues the actual manual labor, which is overwhelmingly performed by members of marginalized social groups. And uh, it also undervalues its importance. As long as you carry out the task, it seems things will get done, but actually nothing gets done just by information, just by instructions, unless you know how to do things. Right. Okay. So uh, there. So you might think that why does it matter? 
So, again, uh, maybe, maybe textbooks are saying that te cell is a centralized system, uh, cell is a centralization is natural, that does not make it morally right. So, violence is there in nature, that does not mean that my uh, violence is moral, which is fine, I completely agree. Thing is, the relation about what should be and uh, what is moral and what happens in nature is a bit tricky. So, uh, historically for centuries people have used these moral natural arguments that this is natural to suggest that this is okay. Uh, so, it is not completely unrelated and uh, uh, so projecting this human organization of centralization on nature uh, and uh, similarly projecting the same organization on all sorts of natural system that you see. So, animal social groups have alpha males and this command structure pecking order, uh, there is uh, honey bees have queen bee, earlier they used to be king bee. Uh, so, uh, projecting this on all sort of natural systems gives us an impression that this is, this is pervasive, this is everywhere, uh, this is how all natural systems work and then it seems like this is something wor that, that works. Uh, but that only it only seems like that because we have projected the centralization on nature. Okay, so this is uh, almost the final part of my presentation, and it is about developing alternative metaphors, which is a bit of a tricky scenario because the way this mainstream metaphor has developed has also developed in. Uh, 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 in the same direction that the science was developing. So, the metaphor also fed into what experiments could be done, uh, done, what language was used to talk about these experiments. So, uh, it is hard to think of alternative metaphors from scratch unless you also have, uh, you continue talking to scientists. Uh, but here is a starting point for how these alternative metaphors could be look, uh, could be conceived. So, this is actually not very different from the mainstream metaphor, but the, uh, the reason that I have chosen it is so that it can be, there is also at least a plausible path of transition. It is not completely out of the way, it is uh, uh, dissimilar in an important way. So, if instead of nu uh, you know set of instructions, if we think of a nucleus as a to do list or a scratch pad which is very temporary uh, annotations that we make to do list. Uh, if you think of them, there is no information content, it is very minimal, book tickets, uh, uh, so something like that, pack things, right. There is, there is not much information unless somebody else, I know what to do exactly what to pack, so I will be able to do it, but somebody who can just read my to do list will not be able to do anything. <coughs> it has absolutely no power of control. So, to do list has minimal power of control, it cannot actually tell us what we do, but it can we hope influence our behavior. Uh, there is some predictive ability, if you look at my to do, to do list, you will to some extent will be able to tell things that I will be doing, some things I will not manage to do. So, there is some predictive ability, but it is not very det deterministic. Uh, and more importantly the agency on is on the cell. So, the cell is using this scratch pad, this to do list to organize its life, to maintain its structure, take, take care of each other, uh, the organelles can take care of each other using this uh, scratch pad that they keep, but it is not a store of information or knowledge and it is not very useful to inherit without inheriting all the other information. This metaphor of course, needs to be developed much more to explain more aspects of cellular functioning, uh, but I hope to do that in uh, conversation with biologists. Okay, huh. So, finally what does this, uh, what implications does this have for practice of science and for science education. So, for practice of science this uh, uh, breaks this standard notion of science that we have that it is value free 
and good science should be value free. So scientists should leave their values outside their lab benches before they enter the lab bench and that is how you do good science. So this questions it and suggests that it is possible, uh, uh, first of all it might not be possible to shed our values, but what would be possible and what we should do is be reflexive, about, be reflexive about how our values are shaping our science, uh, which can, so feminist uh, biologist Patricia Govarty uh, has argued that being a feminist biologist has improved her experimental designs. So, uh, and there is also this need for, that, that this suggests, uh, that need for people from diverse social locations to engage in scientific inquiry, which is of course already important for the uh, sake of equity, for the sake of justice, but this is about how science is better, how objectivity is not just a one person's thing, but collectively the scientific inquiry can be more objective if different people from different perspectives uh, uh, do science. Uh, and so uh, often the popular science discourse about how some discovery is overturned and some new finding emerged, it is just it happens. So science was wrong, now we know, so ultimately it is a triumph of science. But there is not much, uh, much probing about why was it wrong in particular way which partly could be spe speculation, could be some argument, uh, but how did people's perspectives in addition to some new, uh, new, new tools, techniques that uh, led to this uh, challenging old assumptions. So, uh, so just science or the, uh, the research of feminist science studies scholars suggests uh, that this uh, science is not value free and does not have to be value free. Uh, for science education, uh, it is important to question these often used metaphors, particularly because in science metaphors are tentative things that are used to convey a particular aspect of a system. Uh, but if you continue using the only metaphor for one thing, that thing becomes the second thing and that is, uh, uh, that impression is incorrect, it is a tentative model. Uh, so there can be alternative metaphors just to highlight this fact that there can be several alternative metaphors to look at one single entity, one single uh, anything. There can be novel, completely weird metaphors, which just highlight that, uh, uh, which of course communicate some aspect of a system, but then they also highlight that this thing is not this thing, this is a tentative uh, exercise that we are doing. And there can be multiple metaphors for the same, thil, uh, sil, uh, same thing to uh, again show this tentative nature of uh, metaphors in science. And educators can also discuss when they are discussing this history of science, uh, how this view of, uh, how did this trajectory of science shape, was, uh, how was it shaped, uh, how did people's perspectives uh, shape their science, influence their science, to give a more accurate understanding of nature of science. Uh, and it is also better for the trust of science, uh, for people for people's trust in science to give a more accurate uh, understanding of how science functions. Okay, thank you. I would be happy to take comments, questions. How do you think such metaphors, alternate metaphors, can take hold in society and academia? If we do it type, uh, top down, I think it would be ironic. Uh, absolutely. So, uh, thing is, uh, it is also not, uh, it is also difficult to do it from ground up because this is science and scientists have authority on it. So, people can't just create metaphors which scientists haven't sanctioned. So, it does not have to be completely top down, 
but it has to be emerging from several layers and top down also should be one part of this because uh, all this argument was predicated on the fact that science doesn't sell think that the cell works like that because without that it just seems that cell is like that but you uh, you are thinking that people shouldn't tell cell is like that because this will bolster some values so that argument isn't there the argument is cell isn't like that so for that you need to draw on science so scientists should tell the uh, uh, work together educators scientists and everybody should work together in uh, problemat problematizing these metaphors coming up with new metaphors does that make sense jian yeah. ha huh? yeah very uh, interesting uh, work and so um, another irony so the other irony is that uh, you know we learn about organic nature uh -huh. in the world from biology <coughs> and what you have shown is that it's the biologists themselves are actually uh, behaving unorganically in a sense because you know hierarchy and organic are in tension so that is one aspect because you also pointed out that uh, you know the metabolic network for example it tells you that there is no one thing uh, that leads uh, that controls the other i mean it basically a kind of a uh, system uh, that sort of affects out there so that is one uh, thing and uh, i mean you did it in cell biology but i'll be very happy if something like this is done in neuroscience and cognitive science because uh, there it's not the dna that takes over but they talk about uh, neurons and brain mm -hmm. and use the control language and hierarchy language uh, so much so that it appears as if you know the scientists have actually forgotten rigor as a requirement for this thing and this is such a kind of a mania i think uh, another area of biology that requires this kind of analysis is uh, neuroscience Um, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I agree. There are some thoughts yeah, emerging from this. So first is there is so about this neuroscience. There is very interesting anecdote about Ernst Haeckel and uh, his view of the central nervous system. Uh, this German biologist Ernst Haeckel, a uh, very celebrated, which is fine. Uh, so it's where uh, there is a history of how he used the metaphor of human body as a republic of cells uh, in early on in his work. and then uh, bismarck reunited uh, germany created germany as a nation and there was some monarchy that was installed and nobody historians don't think that on cycle was explicitly threatened but he was smart enough to know the political climate and he started using the metaphor of human body as a monarchy controlled by the central nervous system so uh, uh, i am just talking about how it resonates with the social structures but there are also multiple reasons why neurons have so it would be very interesting to work on it so we can hopefully do it ha uh -huh. again a somewhat like ironic situation the uh, relation of metaphor uh, isn't just going from society to science yes. it's also going back and forth uh, such as in fascist ideologies we see the country and the nation being represented as a body where the party is the head and people are the feet and but not Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, how do you think we can deal with it in both directions? Yeah, yeah. So, part of uh, being a science educator is about dealing with with this direction of how science is shaped by the social locations. But then uh, there would be different people who would work on uh, uh, whatever science tells. What are the implications for that? So, there are both these sides, both these directions that to work. Uh, there is this feminist uh, science study scholar uh, of uh, uh, Foster Sterling. So she has a paper called uh, "Biology Rights Society: Society Rights Biology." So uh, we'll probably have to work on both directions. So, huh? Like, I'm not aware of the history, but do you think the uh, metaphor used by that neurologist, German neurologist, uh -huh. led to the metaphor being used in the other direction by uh, Nazis in like in Germany, thirty, forty years ago? <laughs> I don't really know, but now these like Bismarck. I don't really know their other <laughs> connection, but it's very easy to see monarchy 
Uh, Hitler also glorified this Frederick the Great and various other uh, old German. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not hard to see how it could have reinforced. Uh, yeah, thanks for the nice talk. As a little bit of an extension to Narajan's question. So, are there other areas, and, uh, and you know, other areas in science where you see this pattern, and maybe outside biology also? If are there examples that come to your mind which you have thought of and which you can share? So, uh, sir, I'll just add to that because I had some. Uh, so, you know, in 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 a cell, when you talk of a cell or any biological system, uh -huh. there is this idea that it is somehow related to a human to human activity or the fact that it is a component of any living object, living, well object, bad word, but uh, mm. living, huh. being, whatever you want to call it. Mm. But for inanimate things, how does it play out? Mm. Mm. Is there a similar vocabulary, similar uh, uh, thought process in describing, or thought process or ideas in describing inanimate uh, systems? So, uh, I will answer the first part of the uh, question more in de more details and I will try, try to talk about how other fields uh, deal with the same phenomena. So, in biology there is this uh, other part of my uh, PhD work is about evolutionary history and how it is written by humans, which is of course it is written by humans, but how it is apparent that it is written by humans. So, there is this idea that reptiles emerged before mammals. right? And the reason that this uh, uh, exists is partly because the assumption of uh, reptiles being primitive uh, makes, uh, helps scientists label the earlier organisms as reptiles, but mammalian ancestors or relatives at the same time are called proto mammals. Earlier they used to be called uh, mammal like reptiles because the assumption was we emerged from reptiles. And it is not like, uh, so for example, dinosaurs are called reptiles. If you look at the features of reptiles, dinosaurs did not have all the features of reptiles. They were not cold blooded. And if you look at the features of mammalian relatives, they had more or less most features of mammals. So, this uh, construction of evolutionary history where mammals are most advanced is also uh, one. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it tells that this is the age of mammals. Textbooks also say this is the age of mammals, Cenozoic era is the age of mammals. So, it seems like it justified that Anthropocene is not a descriptive term, it is uh, it's morally justified. Uh, regarding other fields uh, they, uh, that, uh, so there are some examples like first is this laws of nature that comes from this uh, just uh, uh, like laws as human system, earlier they used to be God's laws. Now, they are nature's laws in a more secular framing, but they are laws. Uh, so, they are not patterns and it comes from the human social uh, institution called uh, legality. So, that could be one example. I have been thinking about these examples, I have not developed any to talk more in detail. There is this uh, uh, feminist. Uh, scientist, physicist uh, Chanda Prescott Weinstein, uh, she has an autobiography called The Disordered Cosmos. So, that might have more examples. Uh, so, with any metaphor, there is a trade off between the simplicity that it in, in its messaging and the lack of information that it provides or rather the information it kind of skirts around. Right. right. And I am mainly talking about this in the perspective of classroom teaching in the school level, where mm -hmm. children are introduced to the concept of the cell from let us say middle school or whatever, and their ideas of the cell are primarily uh, understood and enforced through these metaphors themselves. <coughs> uh, at an early age of education, where you do not want to overburden students with information, and metaphors are easy choices for educators to go to. Uh, although metaphors are very implicitly, you know, they have their biases. The point I'm trying to make is, if you have multiple metaphors of <coughs> opposing nature, right? Although that's very important to have for a for a student who can take that amount of information at an early age, where biases are set uh, or are set and then enforced over time. How do you 
deal with this dichotomy? Yeah, yeah. So that is a good question. One question that I almost <coughs> always get. So I have a response. You know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so two things. This multiple metaphors doesn't really work for younger kids. But for uh, younger kids also, you can talk about the cell in a different way. So if you talk about the cell as uh, maintaining each other, taking organelles taking care of each other, uh, that is not a very conceptually difficult metaphor to understand. It's different, but it's as easy as so we in human society we see both these examples. There are institutions which are controlled from the top. There are institutions which are less so. So we see all these uh, continuum of behaviors. So all of these can be connected to the uh, some concrete phenomena. So some metaphor where the cell just takes care of each other uh, itself, where organelles take care of each other, uh, could be. Uh, used because this uh, metaphor of factory there is this uh, focus on the uh, economically significant word of manufacturing cell is supposed to be manufacturing things uh, and there is less importance on the uh, tasks that happen in human society uh, which are uh, you know doing the dishes it's not yeah 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 so uh, so, uh, so uh, the, uh, since we are focused on this economically important aspect, we project this onto the cell that it's manufacturing, but maybe it's just taking care of each other, hanging out with each other, having coffee, you know. So it uh, is a different way of look, looking at the cell, and it could be also uh, easy to understand for younger students. So my the the thing that I think that the more common in place metaphors at least do is it assigns each organelle a very its characteristic canonical function yeah. which is valued by the education system in terms of how evaluations take place or what we expect children to know about a cell yeah. for example yeah. we do not expect children to understand the complexity of the majority of a cell's function actually being housekeeping like most of what the cell does is ensuring that it continues to function as a cell right it's not that you know it's putting out insulin at a massive rate a lot of it is just it's functioning as a normal cell right now but for a for a child the mitochondria being the power factory of powerhouse of a cell is more yeah, yeah, yeah. important from the institutional perspective of education absolutely and if that doesn't change which obviously is linked with your metaphors that you use in education uh, in terms of the importance that you place on the information that you're giving a child uh. Yeah, yeah, that is a very good point, and it's definitely hard to change. But like, unless we start, nothing will happen. Even if we start, nothing will happen. But <laughs> we should start, <laughs> right? So, this idea that eukaryotes are somehow more advanced than prokaryotes, right? Uh, so, just, I mean, this is a sort of random comment. Uh, I think the, uh, the, uh, the idea being conveyed there somehow is that eukaryotes are more ordered. Like, the, it, they are advanced in terms of being more organized or more ordered than prokaryotes. Right? Implicitly, like, you can see the compartmentalization membranes have actually packaged this thing together and so I think that is the uh, the sort of implicit idea. Uh, so uh, yeah, maybe like one way to, to address this is to actually acknowledge how much like on the one hand to see how prokaryotes also have a great degree of order uh, but on the other hand also to see that life is like largely chaotic like, like uh, I yeah. think there's a great need in uh, science education to talk about how much of it is just chaos right. uh, and like the order is sort of emerging uh, but then you get back to this point that, that uh, he was talking about which is that like at a at a school level like you need some degree of simplification right so yeah. so you have that, that yeah this order point is interesting and 
hard to deal with. So, ironically, Richard Dawkins, who has written God Delusion and argues that there is no God, uh, which I agree with, uh, not as fundamentally, uh, not as much as Richard Dawkins does, but I agree with the uh, idea. Uh, so, but it's interesting that uh, he still has a plan. It's just in the genes. The, his view of uh, cell or organism, there is still a plan. There isn't a view where there is uh, the plan is emerging. So it's hard to think about how this order is emerging, but all life is like that, uh, can be thought of that way. So, uh, yeah. I was just wondering whether, you know, metaphors are here to stay uh, because our, our, I mean, there are limitations to how and what we can express. So we try to draw upon things that we are familiar with in order to explain something that is more complex. And this is probably uh, you know, something that will yeah. continue yeah. to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No matter what. Uh, I mean, there could be more than one metaphors, as uh, Stuart was pointing out. But metaphors will probably stay. Is that, uh, is that a reasonable view? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there is metaphors, there is nothing uh, wrong with metaphors. They are very useful in conveying some very abstract thing very easily. When you say cell is a factor, you grasp it extremely quickly. Uh, there are some aspects of it, right. So, point isn't, uh, it's just this highlighting of metaphors are tentative things. This is, cell is not a factory, heart is not a pump. It's one metaphor to uh, uh, convey particular aspects. Uh, so, as long as there are alternative metaphors, it just becomes clearer that. Uh -huh. uh, uh, question, I mean, I'm just trying to provoke you a little bit and stretch it because you're not taking an epistemic stand. You're still talking about uh, that there be all metaphors kind of thing. But, uh, you know, um, I mean, as a fan of complex systems, uh, and I'm, I'm tending to add a little more epistemic value to network idea, which is in contrast to hierarchy, you know, in a sense. Okay, and therefore, I would say it is due to whatever historical reasons. I mean, people have thought about, you know, that everything should be reduced to one something that is on the top, mm -hmm. then, you know. Uh, all particulars have been <coughs> under some great theory out there, but recent history has shown very clearly that one theory doesn't work. You need multiple models. So multiplicity of modeling uh, is a kind of in, in, in interesting story to talk about. And therefore, we have more evidence to talk about multiplicity rather than one so, sort of you know control theory which will take care of all other things are subsumed under that is not really going to work and we don't have any evidence for that. Right. Okay. So, epistemically it is important for you to also take, I mean I would say instead of talking about you know that all metaphors are required and things like that, I, I think, uh, I mean I would try to for example you know provoke you saying that look, I mean you, if you are taking uh, non-hierarchy <coughs> as an important thing. Then if you hold on to network, for example, which has more epistemic value today, because even in physical systems, for example, the climate uh, problem cannot be handled by using the the only the physics or you know reductionist or analytic models, because we also have to talk about how the uh, how the cycles actually sort of work to stabilize uh, and you know sustain things. Like so, the idea of sustenance also comes because of the network models uh, are not, it does not come merely from the linear models, right? Linear models uh, will uh, assume that, uh, you know, energy is uh, available and you can, you can always consume it kind of thing, you know? But the circular model actually tells you that, you know, uh, there is no, uh, you know, <coughs> continuous supply of energy and things like that. So therefore, there is a good point to, as a counteract, for example, he also asked you like, how do we counteract this, this, uh, this obsession towards uh, this hierarchy. One possibility would be to hold on to something, even as a political stand, because it has a political uh, uh, strength also to combat the rising fascist uh, uh, and also the other kind of uh, models, because science also has some lessons to, 
talk about it because uh, we have very good epistemic strength for network models in all sciences, not just in physics or not just in biology, you know, all over the place. It's a kind of a trans uh, disciplinary kind of uh, theme that one can play around to, to act as a buffer to not only the political parts and also the, the, the structures that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is a good point. I'll think about it. One of the early thought that I'm having is mostly this uh, not trying to say that one model is epistemically superior is a more of a practical question because since this model doesn't exist, right now we are just arguing that let it exist. So that that is a more of a uh, and uh, so once we start developing models, we can evaluate each model based on the prediction that they make. So you start arguing for that, you start developing that model and then the uh, judgment about its epistemic aspects can come. So right now the argument is you are free to develop models, then they can be refuted. But I will think about the larger points that you made. Huh? Okay. Firstly, we are getting <coughs> into the nuances and the uh, finer details for kids, it's a huge amount of information uh, and on top of that, there's a fact that most people are not native English speakers and your work is in English. And like, Pooja, I had a paper on this recently as well. <laughs> 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 uh, the fact that in India, most people learn these things in English, even though they don't speak English and metaphors might not connect with them and metaphors are not easily translatable in other languages. So yeah. How do we deal with that? Maybe? Yeah, the translations could be tricky. You'll have to be innovative, creative about what works in a different context. So it will not be directly translatable, but you can try to come up with a similar uh, metaphor that captures the essential aspects that you want to capture. system in that particular language. So, uh, some, some metaphors can be translated, some would be more tricky, but you can just look at what exists in that particular cultural context and create with some, come up with something else which works for that particular situation. Okay, so, Charu, uh, you have a question. Thank you. I know thanks, thanks. Either a pun or a metaphor, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks. And also thank you, Mayavan, for recording this, staying with us late. And, for, and to all of you for coming. <laughs>